Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us here on INC Live and to a special edition of the preview show. I'm Carl Birmage and I'm joined by the man on the right hand side of my screen, Mr. Joe Neal. Anybody who watches the post fight recaps may recognize his face. Uh, you're going though, John, from covering fights which have just happened to fights which are going to happen. It's kind of a big leap. And, uh, you know, I, I like to be Captain Hindsight and say, oh, I knew this was going to happen. So now people can actually call me out. And I'll look wrong and for once. <laughs> there is a big reason why we're covering this, though. Obviously, anybody who tuned in for the UFC 275 preview show, uh, we did cover Shevchenko versus Santos in detail on that show. But we felt we felt that we could do a lot better in covering that fight. And obviously, John has some um, has some points and opinions which obviously he's very entitled to. But we felt we had to do this fight the justice it deserves. So John has joined me on very very short notice to uh, cover this fight so thank you very much for doing this joe and when i made short notice we're talking like 15 20 minutes ago luckily i look this good all the time so it was no <laughs> it was no real worry for me <laughs> with that being said though we are going to be t talking about the women's flyweight title fight between valentina shevchenko the long reigning champion who is taking on the number four seed tyler santos betting odds for this one you can get shevchenko a minus 720 favorite Tyler Santos comes in at plus 500, but that is the second smallest underdog of any of Shevchenko's title fights since Jessica Andrade. So you could say some punters are giving her a bit more of a chance than the Lauren Murphys and Jennifer Myers of the world. Before we actually talk about the fight, though, I want to use this to talk about some issues that I've had with the UFC, and in particular, how they market their sort of lower profile weight classes. I think on the whole, the UFC are very, very good when it comes to promoting fighters who they see as having star potential. You look at the way that they built up Conor, Ronda, and more recently you look at like the, the Hamzats of the world or the Sean O'Malley's. But if you don't have that star power, or you're in a, a lower profile weight class, it's almost as if the UFC don't even try. And I bring this up in regards to Tyler Santos, because Tyler, in my opinion, poses one of the biggest threats to Shevchenko in her title weight, title weight. She's got a lot of power, she's long for the weight class, 19-1 record, 4-fight winning streak, yet outside of the hardcore fans who watch these kind of preview shows, nobody knows who she is. So if you're like one of the Bob and Bettys of the world, who sort of pick and choose which title fights they want to be invested in, how can you expect them to do that when they've made no attempt to try and build up Tyler as a threat? I mean, her entire career is played out on Fight Pass. Yeah, it's it's really odd, especially with like Valentina, who it, who they want to be that big star. And well, like a lot, I feel like a lot of fans like of her are you know a good mix of casual and the very hardcore fans. Uh, it's kind of awkward, like you know, with, like with Ronda Rousey, who you brought up. The reason you know almost all her fights were big deals because they gave Betch Cohea, you know, like they were spotlighting her on her trash talk, making it seem like a you know, a big opponent for her and vice versa, like Alexa, da Alexis Davis, you know, and uh, like Sarah Kaufman and strike force, of course, was like another one. They, they were building up, you know, these challengers for her. So when the eventual title fight comes, it's, you know, it's a big deal. And they're not doing that with this. I had to, if it wasn't for this fight being announced, I probably would have never have seen any of her fights, sadly. Like, I think I think a big comparison for me is it, it reminds me a lot of what happened with Mighty Mouse. Like Mighty Mouse was another respected, long reigning champion, but I don't think they ever really got behind like Mighty Mouse title fights. And I understand the flyweight division, the smallest men's weight class. It's it's not going to get the same coverage as say a heavyweight or a light heavyweight title bout would do. But can you ever? Did, did you, was there any of Mighty Mouse's title fights that ever felt like a massive deal? Maybe the John Dodson rematch. Maybe the Cejudo rematch. Those were the first two I thought of. I was going to say, like, well, the John Dodson rematch, because the first one was so good. And Dodson did hurt Mighty Mouse in, the, I think, the first or second round, if I remember correctly. And then this, both Cejudo fights were big. Um, other than that, you know, I, I bought the Ray Borg fight, you know. Because I, I wanted to see Mighty Mouse. He was the great at the time. He was considered the greatest ever, and I wanted to watch him fight. But I'm I'm not a casual fan, so it's kind of hard for, you know, like like you said, the Bob's and Betty's of the world to like go. Is this guy worth watching? I guess not. I've never heard of him, and he's so a champion. 
Yeah. Let's talk about Valentina Shevchenko in a bit more detail. 22-3 and three record. Obviously, in a most recent performance, she beat Lauren Murphy in the fourth round. That was her sixth title defense. If she gets another one, she will break Ronda's record for the most title defenses in one weight class. And a lot of these names, very notable. Jessica Andrade, former strawweight champion. Caitlin Chukasian, the current Bellator flyweight champion Liz Carmouche. Joanna Jacek, long reigning strawweight champion, also appearing on this card. And then as a bantamweight, uh, there were wins over Holly Holm, Sarah Kaufman, and the current bantamweight champion, Juliana Pena. Unbeaten as a flyweight, a fight winning streak. You can understand why there are a lot of people who are really supportive of her. Yeah, uh, she she's very dominant. And uh, I, I'm not a fan of her personally, but I have friend I have a friend who is. And uh, when I've asked him why, you know, because, you know, I, I, I don't I'm not a fan. I, I'm kind of curious what his perspective was. And he goes, there's just no one else like her. She just dominates so fluidly, you know, and just so dominant. That's like the only word I can think of it. It, it doesn't seem like anyone's on her level at times. Uh, Jessica Andrade, who I picked to win. If I was a gambling man, I would have bet some money on that. And I'm glad I didn't because that was a that was a, you know, it was a rough one. <laughs> This is a Shevchenko which has, as mentioned before, been very dominant in this weight class. We're starting to see a very interesting situation though with women's flyweight. And obviously we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail when we get to Tyler Santos. You could argue that the people that Shevchenko beat in the title run so far were sort of part of the first wave of women's flyweights. Almost sort of like in, they were still very much that sort of tough girl at the gym mentality. You look at like the Lauren Murphys and Jennifer Myers of the world. Shevchenko managed to blow through them. Now we're getting to the sort of second wave, the people who weren't even in the UFC when Women's Flyweight started. So obviously you've got Tyler Santos, Manon Fielro, Casey O'Neill, Erin Blanchfield. And at 34 years old, with people having a lot more knowledge of how Shevchenko fights, these title defenses could be getting a lot harder. It's just going to get harder and harder. I, I do. You, you brought up a good point. I do think that they made the division for Shevchenko after the two losses to Nunes. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think, I think they made the division for her. They had her fight Priscilla Cachoeira. Then they did tough, you know, because they were like, ah, you know, we know a, co a couple of girls who can make it. We got to make a division. Let's have a tournament for it. And uh, I think, I, you know, but now we're at this point where Talia Santos had her UFC debut well after this division was made. And there is a lot of footage on Valentina Shevchenko. It's just going to get harder and harder from here on out. You don't need to be so squeamish about Nunes. I think the Pena <laughs> fight was closure for me. Oh, you know, that's good. Yeah, I'm waiting for mine. <laughs> Let's talk about Tyler Santos, though, however. 19-1 and one record. Uh, her last fight was a dominant first-round win over Joanne Wood, which was the only highlight of... One of the worst fight nights of all time, the Ketlin Vieira Misha Tate fight night. Uh, notable wins on this winning streak include not only Giorgio, but Roxanne Modafferi, Gillian Robertson, Molly McCann as well. But her UFC debut, you mentioned that. That took place on February 2019, and it was a loss to Mara Barella, a girl who's not even in the UFC right now. You just watched the fight in research for this. Mm. What did you see from that fight that made you think... How did Tyler lose that fight, in your opinion? What could Shevchenko look to exploit in this match? She was, in the first round, she was controlled and, you know, uh, her opponent did land uh, some good ground and pound. And she did, like, act, Santos did do some interesting things. Like, she went to a rubber guard. She tried an X guard, even. Uh, so some, some interesting jujitsu from, from her back. But it wasn't anything, like, mind-blowing um, was, like, the big thing. But she was mostly kind of just controlled against the cage. Like... Just kind of stalled out, and if we, we've seen these from Shevchenko performances, where if she can beat you somewhere safe, she's going to. And I could see, I, I'm almost it almost kind of convinced me like that's how the fight's going to go. You know, I think I just saw how it's going to go. It's going to be a lot of that. Like I think Shevchenko is going to look to clinch, even though her opponent's the longer, and you could assume maybe stronger. I don't, I don't think so. I think. She to try and abuse her against the cage and in the uh, with with the clinch specifically. And Tyler has mentioned in the pre-fight interviews that she she's openly said, "I want to grapple Shevchenko." I think she saw a lot of what happened with the Jennifer Meyer fight, and I can see her trying to utilize a, a very similar sort of game plan. 
it was it was a bit of a strange one with Valentina in that fight because admittedly it was a long layoff for her. I think it was something like eight or nine months between the two Cajun fight nine. and and Jennifer Meyer. Yeah. Were you a bit surprised to see how comfortable Jennifer Meyer was in controlling Shevchenko in that in that second round? We at and I'll, the story of, of that fight for me is uh, we all opened a beer going wow and going into the third round we think it's over because we, me and my best friend scored it two zero you know uh, I haven't watched it since then so you never know uh, we, how wrong we might have been at the time but I, that second round specifically we were I remember just going this is it. I, I I thought Maya didn't have a chance, and here we are, you know. And and of course Shevchenko came back and she won the fight, rightfully so. But you know it, it, that second round was kind of a shocker, and I, I think that has to be what Santos is looking at, going, I can do that, and I can do it better, you know, because in her mind she's the stronger opponent. The the big thing that stood out for me in the Jennifer Maya fight was Shevchenko was very willing to grapple with Maya in those first two rounds, and then after seeing what happened. In the second, she thought, stuff that, I'm just going to play the distance game. And we got that sort of that sort of point-fighting style of fight that Shevchenko can normally do. The sort, almost sort of like bantamweight Shevchenko, relying on counter-strikes and just hitting the point mm. when she comes in. Um, I share a similar, similar game plan to you. I think that Shevchenko may try and look to grapple and try and sort of beat Tyler at what she sees as being her own game. But I can see the distance management coming into play if things don't if things start going against her. I watched uh, the only fight I didn't watch uh, when the fight was announced was her debut, which I managed to watch before this. Um, but when I was watching, I noticed that like from at a distance, it seems like her distance management, like on a heavy technical level, isn't as great as a Shevchenko. As much as I hate saying it, so I think. Th- the, the the presence of a long reach is great, but if you an example is like a Stefan Struve who didn't have a good jab until one fight against Stipe, you know, and the fight the fighters like Mark Hunter were getting in, yeah. I, but then one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite fights ever is him and Mark Hunt, and Mark Hunt was getting inside, like consistently. He was consistently getting inside and landing a uh, left hook because he kind of had she kind of almost forgot how that, that he was seven foot tall and. I, I think Valentina, with her Muay Thai experience, I think she's just going to, you know, figure out a way to get past. I think we could see an awkward round or two, I think, with the distance control. But I think eventually she she's smart. You know, Valentina is very smart. She's very good at adapting, like like in the Maya fight, like you've said. And I could see that after a round or two of awkwardness, it's all it's all her. A big thing that people have noted about Tyler Santos on this current UFC run is the power that she possesses. And we've seen her drop Roxanne Modafferi, we've seen her drop Joanne Wood, and admittedly both of those fighters may be past their prime and maybe not the peak of what they maybe once were. But it's very rare you do see 125ers dropping people. Is the power something for Shevchenko to be worried about? Absolutely. Um... You, it's especially with her. That's the thing I that stands out to me. I go, oh, she's she's tall, she's long, but man, she she hits really hard. Uh, you know, Roxanne has is very tough, um, like historically incredibly tough. Uh, you know, everyone wants to say brings up you know the the Kaufman KO, but she she's always really hard to knock down or put away, and she dropped her, and it didn't look hard. Like it looked like it just kind of glanced her. And if a glancing shot is going to, if I, if it's the one I'm thinking of, if a glancing shot is going to do that, I, you got to wonder. And Joanne Wood is also very tough. I don't think she's ever been finished by strikes and it, she hits really hard. And at 125, it, you know, that's, that's something that's a little special. It's like when Andrade showed up and she knocked out Chikugin in the first round and you went, Oh, Oh, this could be a problem. But this this one might be a little different than the Andrash. Different body styles and different types of power. If there is a concern I have with Tyler in terms of a striking, I, I've noted a couple of them. Uh, she set, she tends to move forward in straight lines, which for someone like Shevchenko, who can be the sort of Marx woman, who just manages to pick her shots all the time, that could be a big concern. And also as well, she does have a tendency to loop her shots. Like we talk about that flurry that dropped Roxanne Modafferi, but that was like big wide arms and 
it, it's I hope that's something from Tyler's perspective that she is able to work on because if not and Shevchenko does try and turn this into a striking match it could be a long night for her uh, I, I uh, the striking matchup could potentially it, whenever you're saying that kind of ring a bell it could potentially look like uh, a fight you're not too fond of but Holly Holm Ronda Rousey Ronda would is a you know very good at doing the bull rush going forward and she has great power in her hooks and Valentina like old Holly is very good at circling playing the matador to the bull and uh that that is something that just kind of crossed my mind I went ah you know she's gonna force her into a straight line and that's how she knocked out Jessica I she forced Jessica I into moving how she wanted by circling and then had her move right into a kick and, and she was very body heavy and targeting Jessica Rye and the moment that Jess started thinking I need to cover down straight up the other end yeah bit of an interesting very calculated very a uh, bit of a strange situation when you look at Shevchenko's last couple of fights because as much as as much as people like to praise Shevchenko and appropriately so she does have some people criticize her for being a boring fighter and I've noticed this trend when it comes to her title defenses which is Dominant win and finish against Jessica Rye. So fight one, fight three, and fight five were all sort of dominant one-sided performances where she got the finish. And fights two, four, and six, she maybe played a little bit safe. She was more of a point fighter, not really a sort of dramatic, domineering performance that some people may be expected to. This is title defense number seven. Are we going to see Shevchenko be the more aggressive fighter again? Is, is this just coincidence? I think it's a mix of uh, I don't I think it's an interesting coincidence. I think it's like Star Trek movies, you know. Uh, they they always say the the even ones are the good ones, <laughs> uh, but I like the first one, so maybe that's wrong. But it, it's I think it's a lot of she she takes what you give her. So if you're a Lauren Murphy who gives her a little too much, she's taking it all and she's you know finishing you. Or if it's like Andrade who isn't really giving her a whole lot except just takedowns and forcing her to stall on top, you know, then, and like Jennifer Maya, we brought that fight up. She's just kind of, you know, she was struggling in the beginning. And then it's like, okay, if you're not going to give me anything in the grappling, I'm just going to give what you give me or take what you give me in the striking realm. And if I can't find the shot, I can't find the shot. And sometimes she does, you know, like in the eye fight, she, she found it. And, uh, the Jukagian fight, she was dominant. Uh, Carmouche didn't give her anything. And if she can't, if the opponent doesn't give her anything, she, she she's boring. You know, there's no easy way to say it, you know, but it is what it is. Let's talk about some of the sort of things that may play out depending on who wins this fight. So obviously with Shevchenko, this would be title defense number seven. Uh, Manon Fielder is going to be fighting um, Caitlin Chukasian. A lot of people thinking that could be a title eliminator. Misha Tate's dropping down to flyweight. She's going to fight Lauren Murphy. Those are two options for her. Obviously, there's going to be the talk about her facing the winner of the Bantamweight title fight. Where do you personally think Shevchenko's future lies if she wins this fight? I think it's for her. I, I, I think, I think uh, there's something special about that one. She kind of she catches my eye in a, in a positive way where I, I see because normally I, I hate being the guy but when I see 125 I go all right so it's either going to be promise or I'm you know not going to be too impressed but she is eye popping promise um, I, like honestly if I was to if she was to get past Chukasian and she does so with the ease that we've seen her beat some of her other opponents. I think that could be close to a pick and fight. I would be very tempted to pick Manon Fiolo against Shevchenko. And that's nothing against Valentina, who I think is a very good fighter. That's just me maybe looking and saying, hey, we've got a 34-year-old here <laughs> who's been competing for nearly 20 years in both Mai Tai and MMA. Maybe it is sort of a changing of the guard. And in, from Tyler Santos' I perspective, what if she wins this fight? How does the flyweight division play out then? If she wins this fight, I am – I'm going to hope – and I, I doubt this will happen. I, I always have that fear of – it's like when Demetrius Johnson lost to Henry Cejudo, who was, a, who was a bankable star. There was talks about closing the division down, and I would hate for that to happen. There's a uh, – despite the fact that I don't care for the division too much, that doesn't mean that women should lose their jobs over this. 
uh, potentially, but I doubt that'll happen. Uh, you know, if Santos wins uh, specifically, um, I think for her, I think an immediate rematch, unless it's just a one a one sided pounding, and Santos is the hammer. You know, there is no rematch kind of statement win. Then I think Faro makes sense. I think another name too that wasn't brought up, but this could be my personal bias because I, you know, I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, Alexa Grasso. I knew you were going to mention Grasso. Division. Yep, <laughs> you know me too well. And she's got, uh, and she's I, got I, that I, fight, and she's got that fight night main event coming up against Vivi as well. So obviously the big pedestal like that, it may be Grasso that they're looking to try and push. I think it's. I think there's three names, and I think their next wins or fights specifically. Or, or four names, because I'm going to count Chikagi in it as well. Uh, I think it's her, obviously Faro. I think Grosso they're going to look at, and I think Tate they're going to look at. Because, I mean, if Tate wins in any fashion, if it's at least a little dominant, they're they're going to push her. They're going to push her to it. It's just me. It's Misha Tate, you know. So put your money where your mouth is, Joe. Who do you think is going to win this one, and how is it going to happen? Uh, I have Valentina winning 4-1. I think I think I, I'm I'm giving Santos one round because I think the awkwardness like Valentina wants to sit there and wants to kind of process things. That could take a round. And this might sound strange for a fighter who has twenty fights on the record, but I still feel there's an element of unknown about Tyler. I think your logic and your head should stay, go with Shevchenko, go where most of the bookmakers are saying. But I think if you are looking to make a cheeky punt, maybe just on like $5 or $10, they've, because of that element of unknown, there is value in picking Tyler Santos. Absolutely. Uh, just because I, you know, I, I'm picking this, and a lot of people t obviously are, if you look at the odds, or a good amount at least, um, that doesn't mean I, I can't be completely wrong and me and others can't be completely wrong. Uh, this isn't like Covington Mosfidal was like my... 100%. I'd bet the house on that one, uh, on Covington winning. Th th this isn't like that. This is not quite a pick em, but, you know, crazier things have happened. And Santos is a legitimate contender. That's the thing the UFC hasn't really done a good job of talking about is Santos is a legitimate contender and is legitimately the number one contender in my mind.